Hello and welcome to Voices of Blue Scope, the podcast where we go behind the scenes at Blue Scope to meet the people who create strength every day. I'm your host, Martin Feld, and thank you for listening. For this episode, we're joined by Greta Stevens, Chief Executive Climate Change and Sustainability, for an update on what's been going on at Blue Scope with regard to climate change and sustainability. Thank you so much for joining the show, Greta. Hi, Martin. Nice to be here. Now, of course, listeners, if they've been following along with the episodes in our feed, uh, they may recall that you appeared in episode 25, uh, among other guests, Anna and Chris, to talk about this exact topic. But some time has passed, you know, new resources have gone out, things have been happening at Blue Scope. So we want to basically have a check of what's been going on at Blue Scope and what people can learn from what's been put out there. But before we dive into that, for people who may not know who you are or what your role at Blue Scope entails, can you give us a bit of an intro to yourself? So I um, joined Blue Scope in 2018 and originally joined to run the New Zealand and Pacific Islands Business Unit as Chief Executive based in New Zealand. And about three years into that role, Mark Vasala, who's our Chief Executive, called me up and said he had been thinking a lot about the importance of climate action to Blue Scope. And he decided to create a role in the executive level uh, Chief Executive of Climate Change and asked me if I was interested and, uh, you know, took me all of about 15 seconds to say, yes, absolutely. Um, I did the role together with New Zealand for the first sort of nine months before I realised it was too much to do and moved back to Australia at the beginning of 2022 to do it full time. And at that point, I picked up the sustainability uh, team as well. What was your appreciation of sustainability in this entire area when you started that role? Yeah, I certainly didn't come into this role as an expert in climate change and sustainability, but I did come into it as an experienced leader in heavy industrial businesses. I'd been chief executive of an aluminium smelter before in the Rio Tinto group and and then obviously uh, the New Zealand business. And in those roles, particularly in New Zealand, you do get a really good look at the energy situation and climate change as a functioning emissions trading system over here. But I think anyone that works in industrial operations for a long time gets a pretty good understanding of what we need to do to sort of minimise waste, save energy and reduce our environmental impacts. So I think I had a practitioner's uh, level view of the area, should we say. Since you've taken on this role and taking into account all of the work of the teams that you mentioned who are working tirelessly in this area at Blue Scope, what can you say about Blue Scope's efforts in dealing with climate change and sustainability and what has been the significance of a lot of the reporting and the messaging that's been going out there, specifically with things like the sustainability reporting suite? I I might just start at sort of the Blue Scope purpose because, you know, we're all familiar inside of Blue Scope with we create and inspire smart solutions in steel to strengthen our communities for the future. And that strengthening our communities for the future is really where sustainability and climate action are embedded. And I see it as everyone in Blue Scope has a role to play in this. And the more I get around the business and talk to people, the more I I think that that is there's a growing realisation that that's the case. And I hope that where we're evolving to is it's a little bit like safety. You know, I don't think anyone in Blue Scope now would dispute that safety is everyone's job. And I think sustainability is also everyone's job. Now, we may not have filtered that all the way through the business yet, but I think that we're getting there. So just to jump onto the reporting suite, you know, we have a few external disclosures, as we call them, go out every year. And the big ones is for us is a sustainability report. But there's also the modern slavery statement, which is a legal requirement in Australia. And this year, we also released our second climate action report, the first one having come out in 2021. So there's a huge amount of information in those, and they're all available on our website at bluescope.com for anyone that wants to have a look at them. In addition, we also did um, a webinar for ESG as well, which was recorded, so you can watch that if you don't want to read the reports. And they show all the progress that we've made. They reiterate our strategy, but particularly in climate in the three years since the first report, we've made a hell of a lot of progress. Um, we've progressed specific projects and got them implemented. We've developed pipelines of projects for the future that add up to meeting our targets. And we've actually reduced our emissions. 
So this year we actually met our 2030 goal for steelmaking emissions intensity. And not only on the climate front or those specific emissions fronts, but there are examples in those reports of um, responsible products and practices. So the things we do with the metal we make now, that makes that have a better impact. And also things that we've done on the environmental front, like lots of water saving, lots of waste reductions, those types of things. Something that strikes me about things like sustainability reporting in the context of a company like Blue Scope, it's it's a global company. There are lots of different, uh, not only disciplines and diverse people working in different departments, but cultures, language backgrounds. You have to kind of offer something that tells this story to so many different audiences, both with people inside and outside the company. Working with various departments across Blue Scope, whether they're in communications or engineering or IT or sales, what are some of the interesting challenges or opportunities that have arisen in creating resources to educate people about what's happening in sustainability at Blue Scope? Yeah, I think there's a challenge for us in when we craft our communications in terms of who is the target audience. And, um, you know, these external disclosures we do aren't specifically tailored for people inside the gate, as I would call it, because People inside the gate already, you know, understand what we do. So they are very tailored towards more of an external reader. Inside the gate, we do we do tend to try and create some more regional types of communications. So some of our countries have um, more localised snapshots where their examples are far closer to home. So one example is our uh, New Zealand sustainability snapshot. Uh, the Australian Steel Markets team creates some really great customer-focused communications. So it's really about trying to tailor them to the to the local um, context. Because as we all know, you know, when you watch the news, something that happened, you know, in your town is far more interesting than something that happened, you know, on the other side of the world. Thinking broadly about lots of different companies, sustainability and climate action are very important issues. People looking at joining companies are looking at this kind of focus, this kind of emphasis. What do you see as some of the other benefits of promoting this as an important topic or theme at Blue Scope? What do people outside of Blue Scope get from interacting with these communications? I think what it does is that it it builds belief in Blue Scope as uh, an ethical and responsible business. We want our customers to feel um, comfortable buying our products, knowing that they've been produced as, as responsibly as possible. Uh, we want the governments in the areas in which we operate to view us as, you know, a partner in the decarbonisation journey. Our investors are a very important target market for us. We, we want people to, to want to be part owners of our company through their shares. There's a lot of reasons for it. We want our communities to be supportive of our presence in their community to view us as an asset rather than a liability. And we want good people to work for us. We want the good people we already have to feel proud that they work for Blue Scope. And we want to attract good talent. And we are seeing, particularly with younger people coming into the workforce, that their employment decisions include the need to have a sense of positive purpose about what they're doing. There are industries such as oil and gas that are very challenged attracting employees at the moment, whereas, you know, you advertise uh, a job in perhaps a, a digital startup and that seems like cool and fun. And, you know, I think we'd rather be viewed as that modern, innovative manufacturer than perhaps uh, a, a relic of the past. No, I totally understand. And linking that to your response to my earlier question about the new second climate action report, this new sustainability reporting suite that's gone out. Are there any examples or case studies that come to mind for you that you would call out as being great examples or achievements in the last couple of years at Blue Scope? Because of course, sustainability, people's minds go to the environment and how we look after the planet, but it also involves other aspects and outcomes within Blue Scope to do with community. Are there any things that pop in your mind that you think are great examples in this new suite of reporting? Yeah, I think that's something that people underestimate in um, sustainability is the importance of um, responsible supply chains. And we do quite a lot of work in that area. And it's something that people inside of Blue Scope might not see so much. So we actually have a responsible sourcing standard, and that actually sets out sort of our intent and our priorities in sustainable sourcing We have a statement of human rights that spells out what our commitments are to human rights and for the people that work in our business but also supply us. 
And we've updated recently a supplier code of conduct that we expect our suppliers to meet. And uh, again, in accordance with Australian legislation, we have the Modern Slavery Statement, and that actually summarises what actual activities we've done to identify and manage human rights risks in our supply chain. That's one of those examples that a huge amount of work goes on in Blue Scope on responsible sourcing, but it's perhaps not as visible to people even in the community or even inside our operations. So that's one example. Another one is in the area of water use. Again, the, the sites that have done a lot of work on it, it's probably well known at those sites. And I think of, say, Western Port or North Star, but other people elsewhere in Blue Scope might not see it as much. So we're doing a, an enormous amount to improve the quality of the water that we discharge and to minimise the amount that we take from community water sources. So uh, across the group now, um, over a third of the water that we use now comes in from recycled sources. And the amount of water we use per tonne of raw steel has declined enormously over the years, just in the last, say, six years or so, from over 2,000 litres per tonne to about 1,200. So really great improvements. But they're the kinds of things that are a bit under the radar for people. Wow. And precisely the reason that communications like this exist, you know, whether they're standalone documents or, or included in annual reports, companies need to be talking about this stuff, right? Yeah, absolutely. There's a real expectation from community and employees, but particularly external stakeholders, that we we cover all of these bases. So, you know, I think once upon a time it was, you know, you put out your uh, your air emissions or your water emissions data and and your um, safety lagging indicators, and that was kind of it. Now there's actually a really really wide range of sustainability indicators that people are looking at us about. When you are out and about, maybe at conferences or speaking at webinars or representing Blue Scope in your role, what kind of questions or major interest do you receive from people outside the company? What what do people tend to be most interested in? I'm, I'm curious to know that given that some people don't know about, for example, the water consumption or the responsible supply chains aspect that you mentioned. What do people ask about? Yeah, well, this year when we did our ESG roadshow with investors, um, our lagging indicator for safety, our high TREFA rate, we haven't done a particularly great job. Our TREFA rate has gone up over the last couple of years. So there was a lot of conversation about that. And we talked about the global refocus on safety that was launched in, in July this year and um, just bringing back the emphasis to making sure that our safety foundations are strong and we're doing all those basics well. But people are also interested in the newer approach, the the human and organisational performance uh, work that we do where we have learning teams and we we ask the 4D questions and those types of things. So safety is one of them. The technical side of what is it going to take to decarbonise iron and steelmaking is the most frequently asked question and myself and my team talk that one through over and over again about you know how much of the world's steel is made through blast furnaces 70 percent (laughs) and the difference between primary steel making and secondary steel making which is the recycled steel making and how we believe that the use of direct reduced iron is probably the pathway for in our australian operations to reduce emissions production Whereas in um, North Star, we're already using EAF to make secondary steel and we're one of the lowest emissions footprint steel makers in the world at that site because we use emissions-free energy. And then over in New Zealand, we're between the two. We currently do make a coal-based form of DRI, but it's got quite a high emissions footprint. But we're now installing the EAF, which will be commissioned in 2026, and that will Um, more than half the footprint of that site, a million tonne reduction. People are pretty impressed by that number. It's actually an enormous industrial decarbonisation project, the biggest that New Zealand will have ever seen, and actually 1% of New Zealand's emissions. So there's some of the things, um, you know, and sometimes people ask very, very technical questions, and I won't go into that today because I don't want to eliminate the fun of reading the Climate Action Report for our listeners. (laughs) <laughs> and look, I, I imagine it's difficult to keep all of this in your head because I know if you go to any particular department or kind of manufacturing area within Blue Scope, any of the sites around the world, even just a particular department on a line 
is kind of complex to get your head around. And then to take all of the context, all of the reach of Blue Scope's operations globally and how they all intertwine and integrate, even if you just look somewhere like the Port Campbell Steelworks in Australia, that integrated steelworks to understand the operations of that place alone is kind of mind boggling. On that note, thinking about all of the uh, the experience and the knowledge that you've uh, accumulated in this role and working with various uh, relevant teams who are contributing to this across Blue Scope, if I can ask you a more kind of personal question, if you don't mind, you announced recently that you're going to be wrapping up with Blue Scope. You're going to be retiring and moving on. How does it feel to have come to that decision? Um, and how do you feel on the journey of decarbonisation to have made this choice? Yeah, it it, uh, it feels weird to be perfectly honest. I, I've got a lot of emotions about it. Um, I'm I'm happy and I'm scared and and I'm sure when the day comes I'll be really sad as well. Um, so it's not an easy decision. But like most people, there's a whole lot of things I want to do in my personal life that I haven't been able to do while I'm working full time. And I've been working. I feel like I've never stopped. I just went continuously from high school through university into work. I've been working for 34 years, so it's time to do something else, which is great. Things such as hiking, which I love, and biking and knitting uh, and time with my my family, and especially I have two grandchildren now as well. So, But in terms of how does that fit into decarbonisation, I don't think I'm going to stop working on climate change and sustainability. Um, And, in fact, I don't think that the world can afford for people like me to stop working on it. I think it's our generation's responsibility to fix this or at least make sure that fix is well underway on behalf of those subsequent generations. But I'll find something that isn't a full-time job, something where I'm still able to contribute to, to the leadership of progress in this regard. And something I've observed while I've been doing this role is that There are a lot of government entities in particular working on trying to get policies in place and practices to promote decarbonisation, but they do tend to be a bit light on for industrial experience, and I think uh, that is something I would like to encourage them to, uh, to get more of. Brilliant. And thank you for sharing that response and your own personal angle. Congratulations. It's a good idea, I think. Go enjoy time with family and get out in the natural world. Hiking sounds great. I will ask you, though, linking to people, you know, coming into Blue Scope, we are in this intergenerational or multi-generational workforce. You've got people coming in that that handing over of these responsibilities to new people coming in. What would you say to people who are looking at joining a company like Blue Scope who are taking this issue very, very seriously and want to play their part, who want to contribute? Yeah, well, I think the good news is if you really want to have an impact on climate change, then actually working for a company that has a substantial decarbonisation challenge gives you far more leverage to be able to make a difference, Uh, a lot more leverage than sort of um, standing outside the gate criticising. Inside the gate, you can actually really get some things done. And you don't have to be a scientist or an engineer to have a positive impact on climate like any role in the business can because, now when I look back over my career, even though I said, you know, I've only come to this in the last few years of my career, I think every job I have ever done in my 34 years has actually involved significant elements of improvement, which has been, you know, we used to just do it to save money, using less energy, using less fuel, making less waste, making better quality products that last longer. All of those things are sustainability actions, and I think everybody in Blue Scope works on those things. So, you know, I think it's a really exciting time for people coming into the business. You know, for people in production roles, we underestimate the impact that making a really good quality corrosion-resistant product to put out in the environment is an environmental win. If you have a roof that lasts 10 years longer, 20 years longer, then you have reduced the need to make more steel, which in turn improves sustainability. So I think everyone in Blue Scope gets to work on this. And I think sometimes reframing the work that you do in your everyday tasks in these terms can really contribute to making the job more satisfying. Well, I think that's a fantastic message to end the episode on. But just in case, uh, is there anything that I haven't asked you in the course of this interview that you'd like to touch on or to uh, share with listeners? 
just a bit of a call to arms. You know, we've made really good progress. We've got a great plan in front of us, but there's still a lot of work to be done. And it's going to require us to think differently about the way we do things and adapt. So we're going to need to continue to innovate. Collaboration is going to be really important to decarbonisation. This isn't something that we can do individually. We have to do it together. So it's those creative thinking and collaborative skills that are going to be really, really important, just as much as some of perhaps the traditional technical skills. Well, thank you for sharing your time with us, Greta, and for addressing listeners in this way. It's been great to have you on Voices of Blue Scope. Thanks. I really enjoyed the opportunity. And all the best for your future post-retirement. Fantastic. Keep a watch out for me on LinkedIn and find out what I'm up to. That's it. And turning to you, listeners, thank you so much for joining us today and listening to this uh, special interview with Greta Stevens. Um, if you'd like to learn more about anything that you've heard in the course of this episode, whether it's a sustainability reporting suite, other resources on the website, even complimentary YouTube videos, make sure to check the links and show notes in your browser or podcast app of choice. And until next time, thank you so much for listening to Voices of Blue Scope. See you later.